Thank you. Please take your seats. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tani Cantil Sakuue, the President and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. And on behalf of PPIC and our board, and we have several members here today, we have Steve Olson, Louise Bryson, and Cassandra Pye, and our wonderful staff. We thank you for being here. Today is a special event as part of our 2024 Speaker Series event. It is a discussion today about the future of California's economy. Our nation's economy, and California's included, is undergoing a transformative change. And our response to it will have an effect for many years. Our response will also determine that all communities be a part of the opportunity and transformation. At PPIC, we provide objective facts and thoughtful analysis to help our civic leaders through this change. Earlier this month, we launched the Economic Policy Center, and in a few moments, you'll be able to hear directly from Sarah Bone, Dr. Bone, our director and economist, about the Economic Policy Center in a short video. But at PPIC, we aim to focus on the business and the employees who drive our economy, as well as to identify realistic solutions to the challenges they face. So soon, as I pointed out, you will hear a video or see a video from Dr. Bone. But before we start officially, I have a few announcements. And the first is the fact that we're able to open this up to the public gratis here in person and online is thanks to our generous sponsors who you'll see that are on our screen as well as on a list on your table. We also have support for the speaker series event from our donor circle and our corporate circle. And these sponsors and donors truly understand the need for objective data that informs the policies of California. We thank them. We invite you to go to our website to see the full list and to consider yourself as a sponsor or donor or supporter of PPIC. Also, PPIC is a charitable trust. And that basically means we do not endorse, support, lobby for ballot initiatives, specific pieces of legislation, or persons running for office. So today, while we all have time with this distinguished panel, we also provide an opportunity for a little democracy. 45 minutes of Q&A from the audience and from our online audience. And so we ask that when you do wish to speak, raise your hand, state your name and your organization if you have one, and a member of our PPI staff will provide a microphone for you to ask your question. Also, for those of you online, Please send an email. You'll hear it from me. You'll see it on the screen, and we'll remind you later. It's at ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Also, please include your name and organization if you, are, if you have one. Lastly, you hear this everywhere. Please silence your cell phone. Now, I am about to show you this short video from Dr. Bone, our director, but I do want to say something about our distinguished panel. Uh, we have, are lucky to have leaders in their fields, people who talk and influence and study our economy in California. We are also delighted and to have Kai Rizdahl uh, of Marketplace. Now, because this is a diverse audience of different ages, I'm just going to tell you, Marketplace <laughs> is the radio and podcast that will make you feel smarter than you are. You don't need an econ degree as it's advertised. Kai Rizdahl has been the host and editor since 2005. Emmy award winning, uh, really public figure in business and economy in the country. We are delighted and pleased to have you, sir. Thank you. And now the video. Over the past century, California has established itself as a powerhouse of innovation and wealth creation, and we have great potential to address the changes facing our state's economy while broadening opportunity. The reality is we've weathered a lot, economically speaking, over the past few years. 
So we need to understand the major forces that are reshaping economic opportunity in the state in order to formulate and inform state policy that is forward-looking and helps us be more resilient going forward. So top of mind for us are things like the state's changing demography, the fact that we're aging, and that's actually shrinking the pool of workers that businesses have to draw from and that we as Californians can rely on for the things that we need in our daily lives. Uh, another major force is the role of climate and how the increasing likelihood of major climate events affect economic activity and the opportunities that we have across business and, and jobs. Another one is the uncertainty of technological changes like automation and AI. The pandemic changed how a lot of people work, where they work, and that's going to have implications for our labor market, for our, our cities, our regions, and the kind of needs that both businesses and workers have to be successful and to be prosperous. These are all real forces that California's families, its businesses, its policymakers are contending with. With the present economic challenges, as well as new ones on the horizon, I believe it's more important than ever that California ensure that all of its people can thrive economically. And that's where we come in. The mission of PPIC's Economic Policy Center is to inspire practical policy solutions that do just that, that help create a robust, resilient economy that increases opportunities for workers, for businesses, and for all families statewide. We will be tracking trends so that we understand what's afoot in California, economically speaking. We will be evaluating policy to know what's working, what's not working, and what potential solutions are out there. And we'll be identifying barriers to advancement. Then we'll be thinking about the practical policy solutions to address them. My hope is that with rigorous, trusted data and research, the state's leaders and its people can make decisions that best leverage those strengths that set us all up to secure that good job, build a successful business, buy a home, and set us up for a strong future where all can thrive economically. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy days uh, on a day, frankly, where it's colder in Sacramento than it is in Los Angeles, uh, you know, whatever, um, to, to uh, participate uh, in, this, in this really important panel. And when I say participate, there will be a chance at the end. We're going to go half an hour, 40-ish minutes, um, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, there will be, as uh, Tony said, mic runners. They will come to you. They will hold the mic, so don't get carried away. Also, I would encourage you uh, that questions from the floor end actually in a question, right? Uh, and let's keep them brief so that we can get as many people in as we can. That applies uh, online as well. We'll do a very brief introduction and then we're gonna get going because we have a lot of ground to cover uh, and not a whole lot of time. Um, Ruben Barales, uh, Senior Vice President for External Relations uh, at Wells Fargo, also formerly of the San Diego Chamber of Commerce via the Bush, George W. Bush White House. Sarbonne is the actual economist on this panel, so if you have actual economic questions, direct them to her. Cindy Chavez from uh, the Santa Clara County uh, Board of Supervisors, before that the San Jose City Council, before that the Vice Mayor, she's done everything in politics that you can do at the local and county level. And then of course Paul Granillo from the Inland Empire Economic Partnership, uh, doing regional work so important down there. Quickly, because we have a lot to get through, and this is the only time I'm going to go in a row, except Sarah, I'm going to leave you for last. Um, in your area of expertise, which is to say business, government, and regional issues, define the California economy right now as you see it. A lot of opportunity and a lot of challenges. Uh, um, it is uh, as dire as some say the California economy is, it's the largest state economy in the country. I mean, it's a driving force. Um, and so it's just, it's such a large market, you can't ignore it. Um, and, and business has to be here uh, small and large. Um, so it's an incredible opportunity in terms of a large market. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll go through the challenges, mm -hmm. but uh, the top on my list is housing affordability or lack of it. Okay, Cindy? I would say for low income families, um, it's a treacherous time. And um, 
in the community that I represent, I'm, I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley and I represent some of the poorest people in the state. And we're looking at a place where we have um, a third of the people in Silicon Valley own their homes. That used to be two thirds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we only have, uh, in, of, the, of that population, only 13% of the Latino population and 9% of the African American population own their homes. And Santa Clara County is about 40% Asian, 30% Latino, um, and, and about 25% white. And so what I would say is that we have a lot of work to do. Paul? Bifurcated. <laughs> it's, it's like today, you know. It's uh, Valentine's Day and it's Ash Wednesday, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bifurcated. And so when I look at the Inland Empire, I have to look at a, a very uh, young region, mm -hmm. a growing region, um, and a region that's very uh, vibrant, but the economy is bifurcated. Mm -hmm. And the opportunities that we have um, aren't what they need to be. And so that's the word that sticks out for me. Hmm. All right, economist, go <laughs> ahead. I will, I was, the word resilient comes to mind. We're actually been surprisingly resilient in recovery and the macro indicators are surprisingly good in ways that, you know, every everybody became a dismal economist, I feel like, or right. a dismal scientist over right. the past right. couple of years and prognosticating about a recession, but we're not seeing that yet. That's a sign of resilience. But real resilience would be that if it feels resilient to each family in California, and that's to Echo Paul, where we see a lot of disparity and uh, difference in access to opportunity. So resilient on the whole, which is a good place to start from, but with a lot of, uh, of challenges at the family level. Not unlike we should say the national economy, right? Which is doing well on the macro level. You read the headlines, yeah. but then you get in there and you talk to actual people and they're not feeling so great. Let me stay with you, Sarah, for a second and ask you about um, uh, the changes we are seeing and have seen, right? In, in all of the, um, and I'm sure you've got them at your, at your tables, right? The, the booklet on the introduction of the Economic Policy Center, which to, for the record is a fabulous idea. Um, you talk about how California has been resilient for decades and generations. Here's my question though. It is different this time. It is different now, right? The pandemic has changed things, yeah. the wealth inequality, the bifurcation, the treacherousness, the direness of it. Are you confident that we can be resilient again? Not to keep going on the downer, but you know what I mean. Right? <laughs> well, I am an optimist, even though I'm an economist. So I, I <laughs> do see a lot of strengths. Um, we have had decades of strong economic growth, innovation, wealth creation, you know, innovation that goes be well beyond our borders yep. from California, coexisting with increasing inequality, um, where you know, the structural you know, nature of opportunity in the labor market has bifurcated, as Paul described. Um, those things can coexist but they don't have to coexist. So I think we're on the cusp of, you know, those major transformations that the, the video talked about. Mm -hmm. um, on top of those long-term persistent challenges that we have, cost of living, um, access to good work and upward mobility, um, along with those uh, new challenges on the horizons. But I'm optimistic because the solutions that kind of address both which get to the barriers that people face to building a business, to advancing through their work, mm -hmm. uh, to building their skills, are the same kind of things that we need for those future opportunities to be more kind of widely shared. Paul, take me down to the Inland Empire. Take me down to Riverside and San Bernardino. You go out and you talk to people, what do they say? So to use your line, let's do the numbers. Okay? <laughs> All right. So. Most of you probably don't know that the Inland Empire is the 12th largest MSA uh, out of 390. Uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. Correct. Wow. We are larger than the Bay Area, and next on the list is Boston, 4.6 million people. Half of them are Latino, okay? But of regions of over a million people, we have the lowest baccalaureate attainment in the nation. So when you talk to people, it, the question is, where is the future? Mm -hmm. So I talked about a very young population. The Latino population on average is about 17, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue is our best and brightest don't have opportunities when it comes to uh, the, tech, uh, the tech sector. Um, many of the, the sectors that just 
are part of the equation in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and in San Francisco, uh, Silicon Valley. So we lose our best. We lose our best. Um, you know, my wife works at the UCR Medical School, um, and that medical school was created for us to keep our own and have them be doctors and nurses in our area. Yet we're competing against, you know, hundred thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarship money right. that sucks out our best. And so what we're looking for is the opportunity to have some type of parity. That's what's important for us. So they leave in search of economic mobility. Do they come back? Sometimes, but let's look, talk about doctors. Where you do your residency is where you're going to stay. Right. And that's one of the issues that, that we have. Right, right. Dr. Isaac and I were speaking earlier about, about uh, the Inland Empire. Basically as many people, more people uh, than, than Alabama basically, but as poor as Alabama, something like that. So it's, it's tough down there. Yeah, it's, in places, yeah. in places, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ruben, as, as you sit around, you know, not the boardroom at, at Wells Fargo, but as you're out talking to your clients mm -hmm. and talking to the people that, that you do all that external affairs work with, what is their, I apologize, vibe on this economy? <laughs> <laughs> vibe. Um, it really depends, kind of like uh, California is not really an economy, it's a conglomerate of regional economies. Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on who you ask. Um, you know, there's concern about, you know, tech sector uh, layoffs, but um, the tech sector is still pretty strong mm -hmm. in California, uh, biomedical as well. So I think for, for large corporations, what, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, a little bit of uncertainty, so mm -hmm. that creates got kind of some a downward pressure on budgets and and uh, talent acquisition and all. Um, and I think for small businesses, it's always been tough to be a small business anywhere, but in California. And um, I think that uncertainty is 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 really uh, making it hard for folks to be able to secure capital, interest rates, and the like. Um, so it's it's hard. I just want to say, as a UCR alumni, uh, the Inland Empire. Um, is a place where people are going to you know, find affordable housing. Um, and there are other sectors, regions, Central Valley, where people are going to find housing. And the kind of working premise had been for decades, well, if people go there, you get enough of a market there, mm -hmm. then jobs will be created there. Um, and you're seeing some of that, but maybe not at the pace that we need. Cindy, let's talk about jobs and small businesses and economic development in Santa Clara County. And for those who aren't familiar, Gilroy basically up to Stanford basically, right? Um, a broad diversity of incomes, of educations, of racial and ethnic makeup. How do you do economic development there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I think um, one thing to remember is that we're very blessed in our region to have great community colleges, Stanford, uh, Berkeley, San Jose State University. By the way, San Jose State uh, University produces more engineers than any other school. And so when you look at Silicon Valley, what you're really seeing is Spartans everywhere. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Spartan. <laughs> um, but, but what you see is uh, this incredible, um, and I will use your term about the um, bifurcation between the tech jobs and the tech community and then the lower income jobs. And I'll just give you one um, statistic that may be of interest. So Santa Clara County is a really odd place in many respects in terms of its demographics, but one of the demographics is that 40% of all of the people who live in the county are foreign born. 67% hmm. of all of the folks that are in the tech industry are immigrants. So what that means is that, to your point, we have children growing up in the east side of San Jose who don't have the social mobilization that will allow them to get into C-suites and into these other kinds of opportunities. And you know, one of the things I think about as it relates to California is that um, I, I, in general, am an optimist too. And, and so I think we don't have an option but to think about how do we make the future better. I will say that I think the state as a whole has been so incremental in the way we are addressing really pressing issues that I worry that we're gonna miss the, the window of opportunity for change. Hold that thought, oh politician on the panel, because we're gonna get there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm marking this in red now. Here, so you, you, you bought yourself that question. Um, 
Sarah, though, let me let me take the the uh, the workforce thing, the economic mobility thing. I will point out that you're a labor economist, right? Let's talk about the labor force in this state in a time when migration is being immigration is being throttled. Migration is changing. People are leaving the state of California. Labor force participation rate in this state is down. What are we supposed to do about growing an economy and, and raising all boats if, if the people ain't there? I mean, the economy is people. Like, it is the structure that we built that organizes us, that coordinates us, that, you know, helps us all make our ends meet. So if we don't have people, we don't really have an economy. It's not easy to have economic growth when you have shrinking population. Um, Unless maybe robots or technology can. Well, you know, we can get there too, right? We're going to get to AI, so, yeah, yeah. you know, hold on. So we have a big challenge ahead of us because we have an aging population. Although California's workforce is younger than the rest of the U.S., that's a plus. Nonetheless, it's still aging rapidly. And so we have a smaller and smaller workforce relative to the population. That's, you know, the pressure that we feel right now uh, that I would say businesses feel and that we see in the data to the, the challenge of hiring is real and is likely to be with us for a long time because of that. On the other hand, we have long-term challenges, barriers that individuals face to participating in the labor market, to having the skills that open opportunities for them, um, to connecting with the right kind of jobs, and that's going to continue to be a pressure, I think, as things change, needs change in our economy going forward. So by addressing some of those barriers, whether it's you know on the skill side or say it's on the household side, you know the access to childcare uh, or elder care that allows you to you know meet your family needs while also maintaining a job. There are lots of levers there that can maximize the participation of all Californians. Uh, so that's kind of about you know who in the state currently can can meet those needs, and I think there's a lot that we can and should be doing on those fronts. Uh, but I would say over the long term, actually California has lost people to other states for decades. Uh, it's immigration that has grown our population. And so that you know, external force um, you know, factor is going to be really important to see how it plays out. What are the kind of things that will continue to make the state a draw for people that have like, the, the mix of jobs, living options, housing costs being more reasonable um, to draw people, especially from abroad, but potentially from other states as well. Well, just keep going on that for two seconds, right? And I don't want to get all political about this, but immigration is a labor market story. Discuss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're the labor economist on the panel. <laughs> My dissertation was on immigrants in the, I didn't even in the know workforce. That. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, the, the, it, it's, it's essential. People are, as I said, people are the economy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but there are existential and choices that go well beyond California. So, you know, I, which we can't control and we wouldn't pretend to. Um, but we can address the things that make the state that kind of golden place to be for immigrants, for people from other states, um, uh, you know, to drive help, you know, to drive our economy and help us meet our needs. If you look at the care workforce, uh, it is largely women of color and, and immigrant women of color. Uh, and that need there is only going to grow. Uh, so it, we all know how critical that is to quality of life for our families and those we care about, to have access to affordable, really high quality care. So that's just one example of where, you know, we really can't um, progress without, uh, you know, a diversity of, of workforce. I, I said I wasn't going to go down the row and ask you all the same question, but I am in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and just as, as a reminder, get your questions ready. We're going to go another, you know, 15-ish, 20 minutes, uh, and then the microns will come around. You just raise your hands and they'll come to you. Um, and I, I, <clears throat> I spent some time trying to craft a question about cost of living and this and that, and finally I just wrote, it's too damn expensive. Mm -hmm. Paul, <laughs> what do we do about that? <laughs> it's, it's too Good damn luck. expensive, yeah. right? So three bedroom, two bath uh, house in Riverside is about uh, 600,000. You pick it up, you move it across the county line to Claremont, and it just gained 400,000. You pick it up and you move it to uh, Irvine, and it gained a million dollars. It's the same damn house, right? That has got to change. And, is, uh, and California, if we're going to be successful, we've got to align our regulatory with the needs of the employer community. Because what's happening now is a mismatch 
that is not allowing business uh, to grow in the way that it needs to grow, not allowing it to bring in the workforce that it needs in order to be successful. And that to me is one of the biggest things that we have to focus on. Cindy, same question. It's not really a question, it's a statement. Too damn expensive, but, but build on his answer and tell me what we do about that. You know, I, I don't actually have an answer to that question. That's, that's fair. I, I really don't. And I, and I will say that, you know, we, just to go back to the point I raised about um, the cost of housing in our community, too, is that over 60% of all the people who live in our community are rent burdened or mortgage burdened. Hmm. 60%. And what that means is you're spending more than one third of your income on where you live. And, and that's a problem. And we still have people, and I, I'm gonna go to the childcare workers that we're talking about. So in, in COVID, the state of California lost childcare slots yeah, like mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. In Silicon Valley, we, we lost 500 centers. And today, we only have enough childcare available for one third of all the parents who need the childcare in order to go back to work. So the reason I was focusing a little bit on, on not being incremental is that one of the challenges we have is that we want quality childcare that's affordable. It costs $20,000 for childcare for one year for one child in our community. It doubled in 10 years. Oh, and man. the childcare worker is still at the lowest level that, that she, primarily she, yeah. can possibly mm -hmm. make. And so the real question is, in my mind, and I think your point, and I love that you say that the economy is about people, because the real question is, as a community, as a society, what do we want our society to look like? And what are we willing to do to get there? And you talk about removing regulations, which I think is a, a fair point. And I think in some areas, we need to add them. Because what's happening in our community is we have Investors coming and buying hordes of homes, hordes, yeah. literally, yeah. keeping them vacant while they wait to get somebody in them. That, that, is, that is an economic pressure that's adding already to the pressure that these families are feeling. So I feel, that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm done with incrementalism, maybe too, because I'm gonna be 60 soon, and I'm sort of like, done. No more of that. We need, we don't, we, I don't have a lot of time left on the planet. I wanna make things happen, so. Amen. Uh, I'm going to skip you, Sarah, on this too damn expensive question. Ruben, over to you, and, uh, and put, yeah. put your business hat on here, right? Yeah, it is, it's interesting because you, you say that, and you, you, it's too expensive, and everyone goes to housing yep. because it is, right? And again, that is, that's a, a driving force. The hundreds of thousands of people that are leaving California, which is really almost a an, uh, an, uh, rounding error in terms of a 38 million uh, population, but a lot of them are leaving, I know this because I read the PPIC uh, blogs, <laughs> uh, are leaving because of housing, right? Jobs and housing. Um, and it's one, th so not to answer your question directly, I guess maybe I did, it's housing. Um, for me, the beauty of California from about 1849 to almost 2000 was, wow. you know, that whole manifest destiny in terms of like, you can go, you can build a life, you can, you can own a home and create generational wealth. People are looking for that outside of California now. So that to me does not bode well, except again, I think there, California is so big and there's so much to it that we can't overcome that. And so housing supply mm -hmm. for me would be kind of where to focus. Man, uh, we're gonna need more than an hour on this <laughs> yeah. conversation. Uh, so look, not to put you on the hook, Sarah, for something that, that somebody else at PPIC wrote, maybe on your staff, I don't know. Dean Bonner <laughs> wrote a thing about, is the American dream in California dead? Just building on, on yeah. what Ruben was just saying. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in this state say, yeah, maybe it is. What do you think? That is what our survey shows. Um, you know, Californians are very pessimistic about right now. They're predicting recession. All right, all right wait, and so if, if, hang on, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. If we're pessimistic, how do we do these really aspirational things? Which I know you're an economist and it's not your job to figure that out, but it's Cindy's job. But, but, how, but how do we do it? Right, let's well, do a little solutions journalism here. Okay, so one more dismal point though. <laughs> Stop! I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get there, I promise. Right. I think it's about mobility and it's about the future right. for our children. Right. Right. Uh, that's what, the dismal point is that Californians are, 70% are, you know, think that the state's children will be worse off financially yeah. than their parents when they reach adulthood. That's been a persistent finding. That's not just like a recent pandemic thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we all want solutions for our children to thrive. Yeah. Um, maybe some will thrive outside of California, but I, I, I 
I think that the, the, the chances for upward mobility and building more of that into you know, what's possible in our economy is, is there. So Cindy, I don't, maybe you could get the governor on the phone, I don't know. Um, uh, but, but as you just, I'm sure you have conversations with people in, in Sacramento and the state legislature, right? Um, do they appreciate any sense of economic urgency? I would say yes, and I, and I would say that, you know, just based on the flurry of bills that are focused on housing and trying to remove local control, because I think at the state level they're saying, oh my God, you cities, you're a hot mess, mm -hmm. and so we're going to get in and fix you, and part of that is removing, you know, what they perceive as barriers. Right. Uh, you know, so yes, I think I think that's true. I think the challenge is that we, as Californians, haven't said, here are the four things that we need to do to get us on the right path and s focus on those four things. And and I'm old enough to remember, um, you know, Jerry Brown the first. And when I think about him, <laughs> I think about uh, this idea that we're going to have the best university system in the world, mm -hmm. not just in the country. Yeah. We're going to in the world. We're gonna connect California with freeways and we're gonna make sure that people and goods can get from point A to point B. And, and when I think about, and, and we're gonna invest in schools. And, and at that time, this is pre-Prop 13, you could, you could go to almost any school in California and your social mobility opportunities were higher because the investments, irrespective of the neighborhood you were in, were closer than they are today. So, when I say that I'm, I'm kind of done with incrementalism, what I'm wanting to say is what, it, what is the big plan and then how are we actualizing that plan at a local level that really allows us to, to shift this dramatically? I just want to give you one more kind of pain point but then tell you why I feel mm -hmm. excited about this. And we, in, in, in the community that I live in, if you go to school at a Palo Alto elementary school, we spend, that school district will spend about $22,000 per child to get an education where the homes are in the jillions. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go Jillian. above the millions. The, the but high, The high jillions. The high, the high jillions. <laughs> if you go to the district I represent, um, and you go to an average school district in my community elementary school, we're at $11,000. And so if, if in fact what we're saying is that we want um, young people who can get into these jobs, we actually need to have a fundamental shift in the way we fund institutions and the trade-offs. Like, you know, and there are a lot of trade-offs that we have to think about, but being able to do that again with some, some um, urgency and direction with the idea that the fourth largest economy in the world, the way I think about it, is like a ship that's imbalanced. And it's a big ship, it's an important ship to the United States, but if it tilts, mm -hmm. if we lose the direction, if we don't have the assets and resources where we need them, we are gonna be in big trouble. So now I say, how do we right the ship and you know, right. get moving? Right, so Paul, do you think the risks are that the ship tips more, or do we right it? So, clarification. I said align um, regulation, not remove regulation. Fair. Fair. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> I think that um, it, that's the question, yep. right? So, in yep. Southern California, um, we're a goods movement uh, hub for the world, right? Thank you, all of you who are ordering from Amazon yeah, as you're totally. sitting out there, totally. right? But we are the cause of the growth of warehouses and trucks. We are the yeah. cause because we are choosing to purchase goods in a different way. Yet, in order to meet our regulatory goals in Southern California, uh, the EPA is threatening to take away all of our money. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Air Resources Board mm -hmm. has a piece of this. The South Coast Qual Air Quality Management has a piece of this. The federal government has a piece of this. And you can't just say, well, in order to hit that goal, we're gonna throttle the ports. We're gonna stop ships coming into the ports because then you're gonna do a huge damage to a major driver of the Southern California economy, the economy of California and the nation, yeah. right? So which is it? And it can't be one or the other, it has to be the alignment. And what I don't see, as you, to, to your point, the plan. Where is the plan? California is, as, as Ruben says, a economy of regions. 
And so we have to look at Silicon Valley and say what's good, what's working, and what needs to be fixed. And do the same in the Inland Empire and in the Central Valley. But that's going to need, someone's going to need to sit down and create a plan. The Lieutenant Governor, Newsom, yeah. he advocated for a plan, right? Um, but we don't see that out of the current administration. And I just think that we have to go back there. We're all smart people. We're Californians. And we can fix our problems, but we have to have a place to come together and work on doing that, that, that hard lift. Ruben, is the risk to the upside or I'll the downside it. for the great state of California? Well, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm in the camp kind of like more GDP, the better. And then the policymakers, you all here in Sacramento, kind of figure out how we, how we deal with that and make it more equitable but like grow the frickin' economy, grow the economy, uh, create more. Uh, you know, I don't know anywhere in the world where you go where there's not some inequity, imbalance. Um, I mean, we definitely have it in California. We've got more people under the poverty line, I think, than any other state for sure. Um, so it, that's why Sacramento, you know, policy is mm -hmm. so important in terms of, you know, it's, it's having labor and, and business, uh, the public sector, private sector, labor together, um, trying to you know, figure out how do we grow a more equitable economy, but grow the economy. Okay, how do we grow a more equitable economy? Here's the last question for me, then we're gonna open it up. You all get uh, uh, one magic bullet. You get a wave of your magic wand, and in keeping with you want practical policy solutions, which is what this place is all about, Sarah, you get to go first on this one. What is the policy solution you believe contributes most so the smart to getting kid us where we want to be. The smart first. kid goes first, that's right. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm learning a lot from all of you. I think it's, if I had to pick one word. Sorry, it's gotta be specific. You can't give me this wiffle waffle or whatever, okay? <laughs> it's, it's skills. Okay, you know, so, I think so education. It's education, it's training, it's retraining, okay. it's access to what makes an entrepreneur successful. It's all of the kind of building the uh, on the diversity, the skill, the, the potential of Californians and connecting that to future opportunity. So it, there's a lot of systems that we've created for those purposes. Um, I'm not, and there's a lot that works within that. Um, there's also a lot of, you know, lack of access. Um, there's the costliness of education. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. investing in, you know, retraining when you're working in a low wage job mm -hmm. isn't really very viable for most people. And we have a lot of those people. Um, and those jobs. So, uh, so there's a lot of systems that we, you know, can kind of work with, or we can rethink them for the future. Because I think we all need to know as individuals what the, those future skills are going to help us, kind of, you know, either maintain our jobs going forward. If AI is going to take it over, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the role of the Economist, maybe, um, uh, you know, and the beyond that, works. you know, how climate change is going to affect the world of work. I think that is the kind of baseline, the number one thing I would pick. Cindy, number one thing. Education. Okay. Okay. Ruben, um, Paul, sorry. Education and workforce, one word. So interesting. Cheater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've Ruben, got a compound, that. one word too. Uh, well, number of words. Housing supply, increased housing supply, and increased immigration. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, labor force. Yeah. Sorry, I said that was the last one, but it's actually not. <laughs> and, and let me squeeze you here, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Um, Leadership, which is what requ is required here, requires uh, acts of sacrifice, political sacrifice. It requires acts of great wisdom, and it requires um, an ability to see the future. My question is, do you think the politicians in the state of California, and this is really the one political question, have the guts to do what it takes to fix the state of California? I think many, many do. I really do. Okay. And, and, and I would just say, uh, for all of you in this room, you you know public servants, and you know that so many are willing to die on more than one hill. I, I, think the, the, I think really the challenge for us is that at a, at a statewide level, we not only need a, a governor with a vision, we actually need, and this is something I felt with um, Jerry Brown when he came back the second time, which was he was a total grown up. Now, I didn't agree with I mean, I was mad at him a lot. Um, I think a lot of people probably, you know. <laughs> but I felt like he, he, was willing to, he was willing to say no to allies. He was willing to 
say yes to his enemies. And so what I'm really looking for in the next crop of statewide elected officials is their ability to get in a room and box it out and make people listen to each other in a way that people don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And Ruben, you hit on this, that you know when you're trying to solve a problem at a local level, um, you know, and especially if you're a city council member, I feel so bad for you because everybody thinks you've done everything wrong. You're the mayor, like you're in charge of yes. the world. Um, but, but the truth of the matter is, at a local level, you can, you can do that. You can get people in a room and you can fight out the details and you can make the kind of change that you want to make. We need that exported up yeah. because what we're seeing instead is this top-down you know, control, like, okay, cities, you will do this for housing or you will do that for the environment. I understand why they're doing it, but it's only meaningful if the actions they're taking at a statewide level are therefore not incremental right. and have the, the, the five, 10 year, 15 year vision that says, by passing this and making all of you mad at me, mm -hmm. here's why California is gonna be awesome for your kids and your grandkids. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you need something like a PPIC economic We, we need something center. like a <laughs> economic uh, Okay, so raise your hand. The mic runners will come to you. Uh, again, they will hold the mics, and a uh, question should be in the form of a question. There's one over there. There we go. Let's go over there. They're going to hold Thank the mics. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hold on. I have it. Um, so this past few years, after the with the pandemic, um, there's been a lot of economic pressure and inflation has really been hitting people close to home and close to their wallets. Um, corporate greed has been a huge factor in this. And so how can California sort of hold these companies accountable for their role in this market manipulation that's been happening? Is there anyone on the panel who works for a big company? <laughs> you, 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 get, you get the first way. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, uh, corporate greed, human greed, you know, I think it's, uh, it's all um, related. Um, I'm not sure, but I do know that uh, inflation is going down, which statistically is good for the economy, good for consumers, but consumers don't necessarily feel it. Um, so in terms of people's perceptions of, of you know, where, where the economy is and where it's headed, um, it's a, we don't have enough time to go into the, the well, actual so, so, question. All right, so wait, so let me, let me, let me uh, put, a, put a slightly sharper point on that mm -hmm. question. Um, and, it, and it goes like this. Um, do you believe businesses are responsible for where California finds itself today? And what is their role in the solution? Uh, yeah, businesses are part of the part of the problem, part of the solution. I mean, you can't grow an economy without a vibrant public, a private sector. I mean, you you need a, a, a vibrant private sector, um, which, as I think we all know, is mainly small businesses. And then you o have overwhelmingly, not yeah, mainly, yeah. overwhelmingly Over, small businesses. Overwhelmingly small businesses, and then you have large corporations that are going to do what large corporations do, which mm -hmm. is you know consolidate, um, and aggregate. Uh, and yeah, in some many cases, create a large profit. But um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the regulators. And they're they're pretty good at their job right. in terms of uh, the laws and regulations governing kind of how regulated industries are are supposed to behave. Okay. All right, we'll go out again. Who's there? We go all the way in the corner. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Downs. I'm a member of the California Association of Professional Scientists, and I'm hoping you can help me understand this multivariable question that I've got. Oh formed man, scientists and uh, multivariable questions. So, so uh, we have this Politico article recently that was talked about making downtown great again, getting workers back yep. into their offices. Uh, we have this DGS dashboard that kind of touts how. Uh, uh, remote work has, you know, with remote work, productivity is up, pollution, uh, traffic congestion is down. Uh, we've got kind of this equitable work, uh, equitable access to jobs now that people can do it from their homes. They don't have to drive in. They don't have to pay for child care. The cost of housing uh, near where they work is now not part of that factor. Um, reduce reduction in commute times and kind of that burden of commuting. Uh, Help me, help me understand 
this landscape of, of pushing people back to work and pushing the cost of returning to work on the employers, uh, sorry, on the employees and not, you know, at, at, the, at their expense, you know, kind of using them as the stimulus package for local downtown businesses. Sarah? Well, that's a very interesting <laughs> I mean, it, look, it's a super complicated question yeah. and you got a minute to answer it, go. So remote work was the biggest, fastest transformation in the labor market we've seen, probably will ever see in our lifetimes. We went from 5% of working hours at home to 60% during the pandemic to 30% now, and that's pretty sta stable, right, for about the past year. That's one to two days working remotely, and workers say they want even more of that. But I think we're still in the midst of the, that transformation. I think we're still kind of negotiating between workers, businesses, where we need to be, um, how we can be most productive. So I, I'm still watching it. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I, I know that it you know, creates some opportunities for some. We see an increase in people with disabilities participating in work. There's some anecdotal evidence that could be because of um, the ability to work remotely. And same for women who've, uh, whose employment has picked up more than for men, right. maybe because of the flexibility to care for children. So lots that we're still sorting out in that space. Super quick anecdote and then a follow-up. My 25-year-old son said to me a couple of months ago, Dad, I am never going to work for a company that makes me go to the office five days a week. <laughs> Can't blame him, right? Can't blame him. What does this mean for the future of California's economy, which is the subject at hand? Mm -hmm. It could mean improvements for, for workers, right, who have access to that kind of work. But not everybody does. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of jobs and sectors and businesses that are still face-to-face -face and will still be face-to-face. -face. Um, so I guess it's kind of a weak answer, but we're still sorting it out no, no, also look, regionally. Right. Like you go to any downtown here in, in Sacramento, you see that we're, we're still figuring out what that business district is going to look like. Um, how the businesses that supported office work are doing. Are they moving to suburbs where people are during the day or exurbs? Um, uh, that's still a process that's unfolding. It's a really important point. For as long ago as March of 2020 feels, it was really only four years ago, which, you know, blink of an eye. Uh, we've got an online question, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this comes from our online audience, and this has to do with attracting talent and capital to California. So this is uh, Ashish Vaidya, who's the president and CEO of Growing Inland achievement. Um, and the question is, in a recent survey published in the LA Times, California's national reputation as a place of dreams and prosperity has been significantly tarnished. What specific economic and social policy should be introduced so the state can continue to attract talent and capital into the future? Paul, if you could wave your magic wand again as the economic <laughs> development guy on the council, on the, on the panel, what do you say? So we've discussed housing costs. Yep. You also have to add in energy costs, and then you have to add in talent, right? And then I know we're going to get to the AI piece, right? <laughs> um, but how is that going to change uh, the workforce and give people opportunities? Because perhaps um, they can do something that would be manual, but right. they'll be able to do it from an office uh, location or even a home. So those things are going to change. What California needs to do, again, is to, to double down, when I said education and workforce, yep. right? I need to move a uh, populace of 4.6 million uh, from 21% baccalaureate to 35. Huh. And at the same time, invest in those new technologies, right? What is augmented reality gonna look like? What is uh, virtual reality gonna do for our ability to lift things, move things? Um, it's gonna change the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. And all of that said, if kids don't have um, the ability to get online, yeah. which many still don't, then that's inequitable. I'll, I'll ask this one from my colleague Matt Levin, who covers AI for Marketplace. Raise your hand, Matt, so yeah, everybody yeah. can see you. There you go. Um, so if you've got a question about AI, go to him. Um, <laughs> here's the thing about, about technology now, right? It's not robots replacing uh, blue-collar workers in this economy, Sarah. It's workers, mm -hmm. it's white-collar workers being replaced or the threat mm -hmm. of them being replaced. What do you suppose that means for the future of California's economy? That is very interesting because we have been here before, but maybe we paid attention to it in a different way. Right. As computers, as the information age, also eliminated some jobs, augmented others, created opportunities, moved them around, right? 
Uh, we're here again, but now there's like a broader scope of people and work and businesses that might be affected. Pretty so, much everybody in this room, by the way, just for the record. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. do the numbers yeah. every day, but we're maybe somebody else will do that for us. Uh, so the question is, you know, who are the winners and losers? I think there's such a wide range of what this might look like, and maybe Matt has some scenarios we can run to think about who, who potentially stands to gain and lose from this, what that then means for building into our educational systems, coordinating uh, you know, for us individually to know about the kind of future skills that, right. that will at least buffer us as much as possible. In the middle. Londa Jose Waverly Street Foundation. Um, the video package makes reference to climate change, and you know I think the energy transition that we're going to be experiencing is going to be as transformative as the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can talk about what you think that means for the California's economy, and particularly what that means for workers. I think about places like Richmond, and I think about places like Kern County, um, and it's going to be transformative for workers. And I think that there is, we have the risk of elevating income inequality or solving it, and I wonder how you all would respond to that. Let's talk about it in Santa Clara County, shall we? So I, I think you raise a really powerful point, and this goes back to my, my goal of having a big plan, and one of them is that in California, if we go back to the, the days where, where um, Governor Brown the first was building highways, if we are in the building infrastructure, there are many, many ways we can do that. One is being the most connected state in the world, if we were really to invest, for example, in broadband. The second would be to recognize that we have green jobs coming online every day in the transportation sector. And so one of the challenges that I see is that we, and this really goes back to the point uh, that Sarah was raising, is that in real time, our ability to train people to do a good job where they make a, a, a high wage now and we're looking at high wage jobs in the future, that sector exists today. It, it does, and, and again, I'll just use transportation as one example. In the, in the nine barrier counties where I am, we are looking at, I would say, maybe $20 billion a year in infrastructure development in transportation. Mm. And so some of this is so, us rethinking the, the structure of our environments and, and recognizing that, again, I, I'll tell you the folks in Richmond get pretty hot at me because of some votes I took, but, and, and the reason is they understand this, that from an economic perspective, if we're really thinking about protecting these communities, then we are making the, to your point, the alignment, the policy alignments that allow one job to fade and a new job to come online with the training and the, and the support that people need to get to the new job. And we haven't done that in a way that the, the American worker trusts us. I don't mean just government, I mean trust the economy to do that because we are punishing to people at the bottom rung. We just, we are punishing to them. Sorry, Paul, I, moderator's prerogative here, just on a, on a related question. Um, I think, no offense to any of the other three of you, you're probably the person closest to being actually on the ground and, and talking to people participating in this economy on a, on a day in, day out basis. With what you said about people leaving and, and the average age of, of people, Latinos in, in the empire being 17, do you think, it's not like the apocalypse is coming tomorrow, but do you think we have enough time to get this right? Well, we better, right? <laughs> Otherwise, the apocalypse is possible, right? Um, people need jobs, and we have to remember that an economy is a, a complex thing, right? So mm -hmm. w whether we like it or not, we need corporations that employ a lot of people, provide health care to a lot of people, and give people uh, a path to the middle class and beyond. And so that voice is something that we need to have, we need to hear yeah. because of the tectonic plates underneath everything we're talking about. Um, and the people who just believe that there's, this is you know, the greatest country in the world and they should have an opportunity right, to do as well or better than their parents, um, they're worried right now. 
right? I've got a 12-year-old daughter, and I don't know, you know, yesterday it was Disney characters on the wall, now it's K-pop uh, boy bands, okay? Um, but I also know the things that she, the questions that she comes to me about news, right? Um, and she's listened to you, right? But she's getting that from YouTube, right? Yeah, she's getting yeah. it from different channels. Yeah. And there's got to be a way for us to, to maximize that, to make us smarter and better and more competitive. Yeah. Good news is the tectonic plates move slower, right? Mm -hmm. uh, last one in the back there, and then uh, I think we have to be done. Thanks everyone for being here. I work for the State Assembly, so the PPIC reports are a super great resource for us. Oh. Really excited about the new Economic Policy Center. Uh, my question's for Dr. Bone mostly, but for the panel and uh, I guess at large. I think there's a lot of folks, especially my age and younger, who are skeptical of economics as a field and economists as a profession. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, they have Ouch. these lived experiences that do not always uh, mesh well we'll with the, the kind of abstract charts and data <laughs> that you know economists make their living with. So she's one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> how, how will this new center uh, try and kind of bridge that gap uh, for folks that are having you know real world experience in all of these different issues from housing to healthcare? Uh, how are you going to make sure that you're actually explaining some of the market forces at work to people mm. in these fields and try and kind of bridge that understanding gap? Because I think that a lot of economists are actually trying to work and make these things better, but aren't always kind of, they're kind of disregarded out of hand just uh, kind of, you know, just for what economics has, economics has been historically. I am with you on that, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we've had, you know, a few years of lots of, forecasts that were not accurate. And in general, when we look at kind of economic statistics and all the indicators that we talk about, uh, that tells a one story, but it's not the whole story as I, as I said earlier. Like we need to look at the resilience of the economy and performance of the economy overall, because that matters for how we can all do within it. But we need to look at how individuals, how businesses, how workers are doing. And so what we're gonna do at the center, and hopefully you see that in our materials already, is tell that broader story to think about how it works for different people and how it doesn't, what barriers we face across the state, across the various regions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, in a diverse place, that's a challenge, uh, but we're, we're, we're feeling ambitious because we, we, we believe, with, along with you all, that this is, is critical for our future in the state. The floor is yours, you're in charge now. Uh, thank you, Kai. I'm gonna close us out in just a couple of minutes, but I'm gonna take the privilege to turn the tables on Kai first <laughs> and ask him a question, see how he likes being in the hot seat. Uh, so the question that I have for you, Kai, is we've talked about a lot of challenges uh, for California. What will you be looking for you know, given you have such a broad perspective on how the nation is doing, even economically across the globe, um, what will you be watching for to know if California is headed in the right direction? Yeah, mm. easy. Narrowing of the wealth disparity. Mm -hmm. There's such wealth disparity in this. I mean, just look, look at Cindy's supervisorial district, right? Or the I'm Santa Clara County, right? Stanford with multi-gajillion dollar homes, down to Gilroy, where, you know, agriculture workers who are the heart of this economy in many, many ways can barely afford to get by, right? So if we can narrow that, and we don't have to move the house from, from Riverside across county lines to gain a million dollars in value, then I think we're getting somewhere. The catch is, and, and I ask this question because I'm genuinely curious, I don't know how much time we have. With younger people leaving, with all possible respect, politicians afraid to make many of the hard decisions that are required, right? With corporate America, again, all respect, more interested in the bottom line in many cases, than actually getting the people who participate in the economy to be elevated, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Look, I've been in this state now 25 years. I'm, I remember, sorry, I'll take 30 seconds here. When I was in sixth grade, I got detention after school. Phil Schatzel, the math teacher, gave me detention because I hadn't done my homework. <laughs> true, this, swear to God, this is a true story. I hadn't done my homework. Phil Sch Mr. Schatzel also was doing the eighth grade variety show that week. And so I had to do my detention in uh, the auditorium where all the eighth graders were doing their song and dance routines and this and that. And one of the uh, eighth grade band groups got up and did um, uh, California Dreaming, right? All of these, da, 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 right? And I'm like, this is Briarcliff Manor, New York in freaking February, 
right? <laughs> it's snowy, it's gross, the snow on the ground is mushy, no leaves, what have you. And all I could think of was, wow, California sounds amazing. <laughs> if you had told me 40 years, okay, 50 years ago, <laughs> that I'd have been sitting in Sacramento or living in Los Angeles, having a conversation about the future of the state of California and what the potential is for this place, I'd have told you you're out of your mind. But you have to believe in it because we've done it. And the question is, can we do it again? That's, That's right. the answer to the question. Yeah. Mm. That's a great way to end. So, my clock says one o'clock. I'm getting the you gotta go sign. I thank you so much for your time. I thank the panel for your answers and for your perspectives. And I thank the Public Policy Institute for having me up today. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.